I've entitled this The Medicine for Every Problem. And I know that that's a huge claim to make. There's a lot of problems, right? A lot of problems. Some people have cancer, and um, some people have family issues. Some people are struggling with pain, just discouragement, loneliness. I mean, you name it, right? All of us have different problems. Um, but the Bible has a medicine that it, it has given us. And I believe that the reason why um, many people, and maybe even a lot of us, have not found this medicine that brings joy is that we don't believe it, and we don't believe that it will help us. And I just want to point to the story of Naaman. Um, Naaman, he was sick with leprosy. He had a great problem, right? And he um, went to the prophet to find out what to do, and the prophet told him, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And he thought, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> How can a dirty water help my problem? And I, I feel like this is what this topic is today. It is such a simple thing that is free to everyone, but most of us don't take advantage of it and don't realize the power that it has. Um, if we look in Proverbs 17.22, the Bible talks about what this medicine is I'm talking about. It says, A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. So being happy, praising, thanking, and actually there's over 800 commands in the Bible to do this, to sing, to praise God, to rejoice. There's not that many to keep the Sabbath, right? <laughs> but... Um, Many of us don't understand or don't tap into this. And how do we? How do we be happy? This is some of the things that I'm going to cover. Um, so just to reiterate, rejoice, praise, give thanks to God continually and in absolutely everything. Just like it says in 1 Thessalonians. It says, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Um, just going to briefly go over my story, my experience that Matt alluded to in the last few months. Um, when I, I'm a sixth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it's strong throughout my family. All eight of my great grandparents were Adventists, so it's just all, you know, both sides. And I was born. And like ever since I was born, I always wanted to do the right thing. It was just a part of me. And even as a little four or five year old, I remember people in the church coming to me and saying, how does it feel to be a perfect child? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I just always naturally wanted to do the right thing. I was always a good girl. When I married, when I was dating my husband, he asked me, like, have you ever done anything wrong? <laughs> and um, from the outside, like, not really. You know, always wanted to do the right thing. Um, but, and I've had, like, God has done wonders in my life. Like, he's protected me, given me a wonderful husband. But all through this experience, like, I, uh, something was missing in my life. And um, just a few months back, you know, I was having a Bible study with my sister-in-law. We started studying the Bible together every week. And just remember sharing with her, um, you know, Tracy, I don't even feel like a Christian because, like, I, I do all these things that are right, but I don't have any of the fruits of the Spirit. I don't have the joy. I don't have the love, the peace. You know, and she didn't really have an answer for me at that point, but um, I just kept sinking down into this discouragement and depression. And while we were traveling last year, um, we did come across several people that had had this revival experience and were experiencing just a radical change in their life and joy and peace. And they both told me they got it from reading Steps to Christ. And so I read Steps to Christ, and I'm like, God, I need this. But then I look at my life, I'm not having it. You know, what am I doing wrong? And um, I did somewhat experience um, just a deeper walk with the Lord, but it didn't last. And I sank back down into that discouragement. And my life was always like, I could never rise above my trials to help other people. I'm always sinking in so many of my own problems. 
So about two or three, it was about three months ago, I think. This is kind of where I was at with my children, where I was having a hard time with them. I was still having health issues. Just everything in my life was so hard. I was like, God, you say that you promised me strength, but I'm not finding it. And where are you? And um, I was just depressed. And I one morning, I just could hardly get out of bed. And then my precious husband, he said to me, um, Lori, why, I think you really could use a break from the kids and a few days off. Why don't you just go somewhere for a few days and I'll take care of the kids. So he volunteered to take care of the kids for four days while I went to my mother's and it was a huge blessing. But while I was there, uh, the last day I was there, my mom, she got out this paper and um, she had been to a seminar by a doctor that had come to visit North Carolina, and it's where a lot of you are from. I don't know if any of you attended. It was at the Fairview Church. This doctor is from Idaho, and he had flown in, and he, um, he has healed over a 1,000 people of cancer at his clinic. And my mom was reading me these notes she had taken. And he does you know, use a lot of the natural remedies and health message, but the main emphasis is on the mind and on teaching people to praise God, rejoice, give thanks and everything. And uh, he says he's healed, you know, or God, he, God has helped heal five people with pancreatic cancer and over a thousand, you know, people that had no hope just from praising God and rejoicing. And I knew all this stuff, like I knew it. But for some reason, when she read that to me, it was like something clicked. And I was like, of course, no wonder I'm having so many problems. I am just complaining about everything, sinking down in discouragement. And so I determined that like, I'm going to start praising God for everything. And so the whole way home, I was just singing. I got out. Glenn, have any of you heard Glenn Kuhn? Yes. Yeah. He talks a lot about praising and rejoicing, and so I listened to him the whole way home. And I got home, and um, the house, <laughs> yeah, my old self would have been so overwhelmed by the, you know, just my kids just feeding themselves frozen fruit out of the bowl. And <laughs> But, you know, I was just like, praise the Lord. I sat my kids down. I said, we're going to do things differently. We're going to start praising Jesus and thanking him when we have trials. And I got them outside. We were running around and leaping for joy. And just then um, I didn't share any of this with Matt with, that I had made this decision. And he actually went out of town. So he was gone for three days. I had the kids to myself now. And uh, right away, once I had this new attitude and new heart, like half of my trials went away just like that. Like my kids were different people, you know, they were not the same kids. And um, so this just, I was just like, wow, like I am happy right now over absolutely nothing, you know? <laughs> and um, so this kept going on for about two weeks and I didn't really share much with Matt, but it was just, and then we had the opportunity to go away for the weekend by ourselves. And what he alluded to last night, we just listened to Desire of Ages all weekend. And I really saw Jesus. I'm like, wow, he's so real. And we're just so excited and praying for revival. And then we get home, and I had some very severe personal trials hit. And um, I just sank down into that discouragement. I was like crying, and I can't um, be open about these trials. But in the past, if I've had trials similar, I mean, I was up for nights at a time, couldn't no peace, couldn't sleep. You know, I would pray, but I wouldn't find that peace. And so here I am, you know, two weeks into my praising. I'm just sitting there crying on the floor. I'm like, I was just thinking, I guess this doesn't work, you know. But then um, I was like, you know what? I don't have anything to lose. I might as well just try it. So I got out my hymnal, and I started singing and just surrendering to God and just, like, trusting. And he filled me with such joy and peace that I couldn't even sit there anymore. Like, I had to get up and, like, run around and, you know. And then I went to sleep like a baby, you know. <laughs> And so uh, he kept doing this for me all week long as those trials were going on. And then um, 
like I realized at that point, wow, God is real. Like he can help. So then, um, you know, I was just, um, the following week, it was a Sunday, and I just spent the afternoon just, well, um, Matt took the girls. Every Sunday, he's so good to give me a little break, and he takes the kids, and I had that time, and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll look for property, because, you know, we wanted to move, or we feel called to go to the country. But then I was like, you know what? I've had such a wonderful experience with Jesus. I want more. I know I've only tasted. So I just spent the time praising God and rejoicing. And then Matt came back, and I I was just so happy and just so full of joy, even despite everything that had happened that week. And I was just that night, I was sharing with Matt, you know, all the stuff that God had done for me. And, you know, he looked at me and he said, you know what, you're right, Lori, you are a different person. And he said, I need what you have. How do I get it? And I was just like, what? (laughs) And I said, well, Matt, you need a miracle just like me. It's a miracle. And we were on our knees till almost midnight that night, wrestling with God and gaining victory and peace. And... um, after this time, like, I literally, I was just so on fire for God and what he had done in my life. I was having trouble sleeping every night just because I was so excited. And um, about a week later, um, I was reading, actually, to my daughters. I decided I'd read them the story of Ellen White, Life Sketches. And before we read, I prayed and I said, God, help us to experience Jesus like Ellen White did. She really knew you. And after I got done praying, then uh, my daughter, she says to me, Mommy, I want an experience like yours. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, just a few, few weeks earlier. She could hardly stand to be around me because I was such a miserable person. And now, as a result of praising God and allowing him to change me like this, here she's wanting what I have, you know? And so um, this kind of began a revival in my life, and I'm going to share um, what I believe are principles that led to it, because I know God wants this, and I, I want to say that I believe I've only tasted of it. What God wants to do in my life is so much greater. And what he wants to do in each of our lives is beyond what we can imagine. And we limit him because we don't ask for it. We don't expect it. And so I know that God wants it for each person in this room today. And um, I'm going to divert a little bit and talk about the mind and what... um, Praising God, like the effect of it. Uh, Ellen White says in Councils on Health that sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Okay, so I bet you there are at least ten of us in this room that have health issues. Is that right? I would be one of them. And Barb is the one that is not caused by her mind. Obviously, she had an accident. But most of us in here that have health issues or are sick, it's because of our thoughts and because of our mind. That's the beginning, the basis of it. And um, actually, when my mom read that to me, the paper that I referred to, um, my first thought was, forget the liver flushes I'm trying to do. I just need to be happy, (laughs) right? Because I was trying all these things. Um, So some of the effects of sadness and anger. In Upward Look, Ellen White says that sadness deadens the circulation in the blood vessels and nerves. So we know that perfect health depends on circulation, and sadness deadens that. It also retards the action of the liver. It hinders the process of digestion and of nutrition and has a tendency to dry up the marrow of the whole system. Uh, What about anger? Anger produces hormones like norepinephrine. It's a stress hormone. It raises blood pressure. It causes memory loss. It causes lack of oxygen and can damage brain cells so they can't function properly. Then you can't think correctly, and negative thoughts occur, which causes depression. 
So this is also a very helpful quote from Ministry of Healing 251. It says, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. So, like nothing, not um, all the cleansing diets, all the vegetarian, you know, all the diets and treatments, natural remedies we can do, nothing will help as much as having a spirit of gratitude and praise. And even if we are in an accident like Barb, like having a spirit of gratitude and praise, God can heal us much faster. Um, now, I believe that praising and thanking God does produce this joy, but there's also um, another very important aspect to what happened in my life that I believe, um, and that is, well, in this verse, Romans 15, 13, it says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So when we believe, it brings joy. So in believing what? I believe in believing the promises of God. Now, uh, Glenn Kuhn says that there are over 3,000 promises in God's word that we can take and claim as our own, right? Um, God does not lie, and this is his word. And when we believe his word, it becomes a reality in our life. Um, just a few quote, uh, verses about faith. In Hebrews it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. James says, Ye have not, because ye ask not. And in Matthew, Jesus tells the blind men that were blind, he says, According to your faith be it unto you. And this is actually what I told Matt that night. We needed a miracle, you know, and uh, he came to me and says, I need what you have. And that's, that's what came out of my mouth. It's like, according to your faith, be it unto you. So we stayed on our knees until he had what he needed, the joy and the peace. Um, now, turn in your Bibles with me to what has become one of my new favorite Bible stories and Bible verses. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is the story of King Jehoshaphat. And yeah, in verse um, 2, it says, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea. So he had armies that were coming to battle against him. And instead of Tr trusting in his armies or his men or people, he proclaimed a fast. We see that in verse 3 throughout all Judah. It says he feared, he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast. Um, now, in your own time, read the next little section. It's just powerful. Basically, he spent time saying, God, you did this in the past, and you did this and this and this. And then in verse 12, he says, we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. So he did not trust in himself, but he said, God, you can deliver me. And then God answered and said, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And uh, then what has come to become my New favorite verse. Um, well, instead of getting their weapons, I mean, God told them they weren't going to need to fight, right? So instead of gathering their weapons, he appointed singers to go out and praise God. And then verse 22 says, When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they were smitten. So when they began to sing and praise, God defeated their enemies. And I believe that this um, chapter uh, really sets up an example for us because the battles coming against us are our trials, our problems. And when we set ourselves and we say, God, we can't do this, but you're going to do it. And then we sing and we praise for what he's going to do then he defeats our enemies, right? 
And I, since I've had this experience with just praising Jesus and Him changing my life, um, those around me, I've shared it with, and I see the same thing starting to happen in them, and it's really neat. Um, one of them is my aunt, and I shared everything that happened to her, and she's been um, going through a similar experience, just praising God and Him reviving and changing her life. Um, but one morning, she texted me, and she said, Lori, I need prayer. She said, I am out visiting my two grandkids in San Francisco, and I have to watch them all day by myself, and I am so sick. She had two ear infections, a cough, a sore throat. I mean, she, she said, I feel like I'm on my deathbed, and I have these two kids. And she said to me, and it's literally like they're demon-possessed. They, they have atheists. Their parents are, are not believers. They're atheists. And um, so she's like, pray for me, please. Now, the old Lori in my past, I would have said, I'll pray for you. And then I would have said a prayer. Um, but knowing what I know now, that our trials are from, you know, for our good, um, I just texted her back and I said, Christina, start praising God for the miracle he's going to do today. And then I texted her um, this quote, and I also texted her Isaiah 40, 39, about he giveth power to the faint, to them that have no strength, might he increase his strength. And then I just encouraged her, at, you know, go to, with those boys and ask for a miracle. When they see what God can do in you, they will, um, they will know that he's real. Because these kids are struggling. Is God real? Is God a real? Their parents are teaching them evolution, and they don't know. So anyways, just talking with her later, she said that my text gave her the encouragement she needed to get out of bed and get on her knees. And she did what I said. She started thanking and praising God for what he was going to do. She went to each boy individually. They're three and six. And she said, Grandma is sick. I need a miracle today. We, let's pray that I will be well enough to take care of you and that you can be a good boy today. And um, th the next day, she texted me, and she said, Lori, I can't even put into words the miracle that happened yesterday. You know, she said, you would have to know these boys to understand. But she said, I did not have one issue all day long. <laughs> and beyond that, she said that when the parents came home that night, she was able to share with her son, who is an atheist, I asked for a miracle, and God did it. And these, because the boys were still fine, they were still good when the parents came home, and the parents were able to see the miracle. And um, we've all had days like that. We've all had days where we feel like, oh, this is going to be terrible. And a lot of times it is, right? Because we were thinking it's going to be so terrible, but. Um, this, we have this promise when we start praising God for what he's going to do, he changes it, works it into a miracle. Um, there's also this story in Acts 16, uh, when Paul and Silas got put in prison. And here they are bound in um, stocks and bonds. And it says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, one morning I read this, and I'm like, I've got to read this to my children. So I called them over. I said, look, girls. And I told them the story. And I said, Hannah and Haley, do you think that any trial that you're going to have is as bad as being, you know, have your arms and legs tied up in prison and in the middle of the night when you can't sleep? And they said, no. And so I asked them, is there any reason today that you can't praise God for everything that happens? And they said, yeah, let's do that. And so we just started singing and praising God and all day long. Do you know, at the end of the day, um, I overheard my girls talking and they said, this is the best day we've ever had. <laughs> and then I went and I asked them, did anything special happen today? No. <laughs> it was just that they had chosen to praise God and be happy. Um, and I re referred to this verse earlier in Deuteronomy. It says, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And in the past, I'd always claim this verse. I'm like, God, you promised to give me strength. But then oftentimes, I'd go about my day, and I wouldn't feel that strength. I'm like, where is it? 
But then when you pair that with Nehemiah 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I realize that if I am not praising God and seeing the goodness of Him, then I am passing up on the strength that He has to give me. Um, now, Glenn Kuhn, he tells a lot of wonderful stories. He's actually a preacher, for those who aren't familiar with him. He's dead now, but he, that man knew Jesus, and he had a lot of wonderful, inspiring stories. And he tells a story about when he was very sick. I think he might have had cancer. I'm not sure. I didn't go back to review this story. But he says that one day he was reading Ministry of Healing by Ellen White, and it said, those who desire to be well should make up their minds to be well. And so he did this. He said, Lord, I believe this is from you. And then he went and um, he started finding promises in the Bible about being well. And he, he was a pastor, so he would claim these promises and, and just sing and rejoice that God was healing him. And then he would go and do his work, and then he would start to get weak. And then he would go back and praise God more and thank him. And eventually he was healed. Um, so now I'm just going to go into uh, some practical steps of things that I have implemented into my life that I believe have, um, you, you know, you, you may be wanting the same thing for your life if you're not already experiencing the peace, the joy, the fruits of the Spirit, basically. Um, the first thing that I did when I decided that I was going to start praising God was I decided to write down and speak out loud 10 things that I was thankful for every day for at least 10 days. Now, this is what Glenn Kuhn recommends to do, because um, uh, he said that there's a lot of power in writing it down and speaking it. And so he would have these, this list of 10 things, and as your day goes on, go back through them. So like, for example, the first day, I wrote down, I'm thankful for my hair and um, my house and all these things. And you know, like, I was... Um, leaving the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I was like, I have hair! <laughs> and there was this burst of joy. And that sounds silly, but there was a time in my life when I didn't have much hair. It was all falling out and it was I was a teenager and so it was one of the biggest trials of my life and I'm like, Lord, just give me hair. Well, now I have hair, right? And so I realized that there's a lot of trial, past trials in my life that God has answered and taken care of that I've forgotten about, you know? When we were traveling, my big trial was, Lord, can we just have a house? Can we just settle down, right? Well, now we have a home, right? So I can be thankful. And uh, if you go to Glenn Coon, he has story after story about how just doing this has changed marriages, has healed people, um, just all kinds of stuff. Um, number two, think, speak, and focus only on positive things. According to Philippians 4.8, um, God tells us that we're supposed to focus on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise. Um, because whatever we focus on grows. Um, and I just wanted to add in there, like one of the biggest things is like we can look at the faults of other people. And something that God has convicted me of recently, in Titus 3, verse 2, it says, Speak evil of no man. And 1 Peter 2, 17, it says, Honor all men. And even Ella White says that when we think negative thoughts towards somebody else, think of something positive and speak that about that person's life. Um, and I've also just asked God to change the heart instead of, because if I'm always like wanting to say it, um, but just stopping myself, then it's really a heart issue. Lord, give me love for my brother. Ellen White says that it should be painful when we hear evil spoken of by our brother. You know, we shouldn't say, oh, you know, it should make us feel good. Um, number three, this has been very helpful to me. Get a songbook, hymnal, scripture songs, and sing. Ministry of Healing says, when tempted, instead of giving utterance to our feelings, let us by faith lift up a song of thanksgiving to God. Song is a weapon that we can always use against discouragement. And these first few weeks, when I was just trying to overcome this so ingrained habit of negativity in my life, 
um, I was pretty much always with my hymnal. Like, you know, being a stay-at-home mom, I'm not really much of a singer, but my kids don't mind. And <laughs> just if I was not doing something else, I would just have my hymnal just singing, 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 not allowing Satan get, to get in with his thoughts, right? Um, also, scripture songs and things like that. Uh, number four, um, I made... I said you can make a list of things you're thankful for, but I even going beyond that, thank God for the trials in your life. Um, knowing what we know, we know that God allows trials into our lives for our good, and that when we see the end from the beginning, we will thank God for those trials. So we might as well start thanking Him now, right? <laughs> Before we can understand why. Um, now, my aunt, she shared this experience with her. As I'm sharing with her what's going on, that we need to start thanking God for our trials, praising Him. She's having this crisis in her life where they told her that she's going to have to leave, leave her apartment. They're wanting to sell it or something. She lives in Denver. Housing is horrible. You cannot find good housing there. And they're situated, they have to be out in two months. They have no idea where they're going, anything. And not only that, she's got all this stuff coming up in her life before then. She doesn't hardly have time to even think about it. And so one more, she told me one morning she was so overwhelmed with life. And just um, she just dropped her knees and said, help God. That's all she can muster. And then finally she went down and got to her Bible. And she said, God, I don't think I can thank you for having to move. It's just too big of a trial, you know. See what I how can I thank you for this? And she opened her Bible and she has some Ellen White helps in there. And it it read, Our trials are all necessary to bring us closer to our Heavenly Father. And so she just started weeping, saying, Okay, God, if this trial will bring me closer to you, then thank you. And um, she was she received the joy and peace of God and knew he was going to take care of her. And then she was able to go to work and share this testimony with even the atheists. And they all say, God's going to, God's going to do something for you. You know, so like already by her choosing to thank God for her trial, others are seeing it in her life. Um, number five, just studying more about faith. It's all about faith as our faith. Christ can work with us, right? He wants to do so much for us, but we limit him and we don't ask him. Um, there's whole places that Jesus could not work a miracle because the people would not believe. Right? Um, number six, learn promises or get a Bible promise book. And so what I've been doing now is I, I take God at his word. So instead of just like asking and asking and asking, I'm like, now I point to your promise. And I mean, it says, call unto me and I will answer you. Amen. So God, I need an answer about this situation. It can't wait because they're waiting on an answer. I need an answer. I'm going to stay here until I, I hear from you, right? And he's promised. But if we come to him and say, God, I don't know if you're really going to answer, then he can't. He won't, right? Um, so number seven, this is what I have been doing for the last couple months. Ask and expect God to work a miracle for you every day. Now, it doesn't have to be something huge, but like a changed heart is the biggest miracle, right? Yeah. So when Christ can take my, you know, sadness or whatever and turn it to joy, that's a miracle. And when he can change, when he can change my heart. And so I just want to, like one example of this, um, like when I started seeing that God could help me, then I felt like I had something to help my kids with. Before they would be upset and tantrum, I had no help for them. I mean, I could tell them, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. But when I had no victory over my thoughts and feelings, how could I help them, right? But now, um, my little girl, Haley, when she's having a tantrum or she's really struggling, crying, angry, angry, I pull her onto my lap and I say, 
Haley, is this the heart that you want? Or would you like Jesus to work a miracle for you? And always, she says, I want a miracle. And so we get on our knees and we say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry. Like I used to repeat, now she's getting to the point she can do it herself. But she asked for forgiveness and she asked Jesus for a new heart. And then I say, Haley, he has given you that new heart. He's promised. Sometimes I take her through the Bible. Um, and so now, like if she's fighting with her sister, then I say, he's given you a new heart. You're no longer angry at your sister. So what are you thankful for about your sister now? Because, right, you have this new heart. And um, then she says what she's thankful for. She gets a big smile on her face. She hops up to play. That is a miracle, right? <laughs> And um, so we're seeing this over and over. Just another example. One day, my other daughter at the table was having a bad attitude. So I sent her to her room. Then I went in there later, and it was very obvious that she still had that same attitude. And I said, sweetie, you need to stay in here a little bit longer. And she said, but I prayed. <laughs> and so then I said, but did you believe? <laughs> And so then I walked her through the steps again. We must pray, and then we believe, and then we act upon it as if he's already done it, even though we don't feel it, right? So, um, and the easiest way is to, like, after we ask for that new heart, pray, believe, then start praising God, start, what are you thankful for, right? Because the, the new heart, that's what it's going to be. If we're angry at someone, start thinking, what do I love about this person or with, you know, and um, these are just little minuscule miracles, but they work. It works. Like I have been, I have woken up in the night so angry about certain things and situations. And I claim Ezekiel 36, Lord, you promised to give me a new heart. And then I do the same steps I did with my daughter and it works today. We can get a miracle every single day. And if we're having a miracle every single day, then God is real. And then we have something to share with the world, right? Amen. It's not something that's just fake and it's drudgery, you know? Um, number eight, stay focused on solutions instead of problems. As I mentioned, whatever we focus on grows. And I, in my past, I would spend an hour or two every morning having devotions. And I would come out of there in the same rotten mood and go yell at my husband or my kids or just like be irritable or not happy. And it was because of this, um, because when I'm focused on my problems or and I don't grasp out to God in faith, it doesn't have any, like, the Bible without faith is useless, right? If we don't believe it. Um, in Romans 2, it says, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And I just wanted to share a little story that happened a few weeks ago. Now, I've been praying in my life, God, I want you to fill me completely. I don't want any outside source to look to for satisfaction, right? I want you to fill everything. And so... Um, you know, I, this is a miracle. I need you to do this miracle in my life, like completely fill me. Okay. So when Matt was having a busy week a few weeks ago, I mean, that's what I should expect, right? <laughs> you know, just play, pray, God, you need to fill me. And then he's having a busy week and he's hardly has time to, usually he spends a lot of time with me, but like every night that week was just packed, everything. And so, <laughs> Um, but there was one night free, and be, right before that evening, he came to me and he said, Hey, honey, my friend called. I'm going for a bike ride. <laughs> and um, my first thought was, you have got to be kidding me, <laughs> right? Like, here, you have know, hardly seen me all week, and you're going for a bike ride? But then I remembered, oh, yeah, I'm praying for Christ to fill me, right? <laughs> and he must have a different plan for my life tonight instead of spending that time with Matt. And so um, he left. And instead of, in the past, like having a pity party, getting angry, just, you know, whatever, 
I decided, I was just praying, God, what do you want me to do with my evening? He impressed me, call a friend from Australia. So I called her, and I just shared what God is doing in my life. And she was just in tears. Just, thank you, Lori, so much for sharing this with me. And it's just what I needed. And, and I was just like, wow, God, if Matt had been here, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And then I, I was about to go to bed. I, I didn't think he was going to be home till really late because he had somewhere else to go after his bike ride. Um, so I sent him a message just telling him I hope he had a great time and I love him and I'll see him in the morning. Um, but a few minutes later, he actually showed up. <laughs> and uh, he had not been, he decided to come home instead of to where he was supposed to go that night. And um, just we had a wonderful talk that night. And I told him of my divine appointment and everything that was happening. And he said to me, you know what, I've just really been thinking about my motives for going tonight. And, you know, it was really selfish. <laughs> and um, he said to me, like, it was because he saw, like, my reaction and my message to him. In the past would have been angry. Now I'm just like, just ha give him the freedom to do that. It convicted him. You know? <laughs> and uh, this right, it says the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. And that's, this is just, I mean, it's not a grievous sin to go ride your bike, right? But this works with bigger sins. When people in our lives have big sins, instead of nagging them and telling them they're wrong, we need to show them the love, the mercy, and the joy of Christ. And that will lead them to repentance. Like we... Ellen White says that we can be books for people to read. Like many people will not open the Bible, but our lives, they can be convicted, right? Yeah. Um, here's a few recommended resources. Glenn Kuhn Sermons, if you haven't heard of him, I recommend going and checking him out. He, all, he has several series on the ABCs of prayer, how to use faith. Um, Joy, everything. They're on justifiedwalk.com, or they're also on Audioverse or YouTube. Matt referenced the Desire of Ages project last night. I believe, I mean, to me, it's the best version of Desire of Ages because it's just so well done. It's an audio version that it just makes you really feel like you're there. And they also do Steps to Christ and the other one. Also the book Ministry of Healing, which you're not and I wanted to end with a story. I'm going to tell a lot of it and read a couple. This story comes by Frank Phillips. He, is a, he was a pastor. He's now dead. And he tells this story that has made an impact on my life. So I wanted to share it. Um, he was at camp meeting one year. And this woman comes to him. She's 26 years old. She has a little baby and a three-year-old. And she says to him uh, that she's desperate to save her marriage. She says, my marriage is falling apart. We've tried everything. Counselors, do you have anything you can do to help me? And he asks her, you know, are you, are you ready to do anything? And she says, I think so. And he said, I want to give you something. And then he handed her this card. And this is what it said on it. It said, this is a quote by Ellen White. The Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. Now, it's kind of a packed paragraph, but basically that's saying that Christ, while he was here on earth, knew that everything that happened to him, including the thorns, the beatings, Everything was allowed by his father. And that was his comfort, right? And it is for us too. So he gave this woman this card and he said, if, well, let me just read it. He said, I believe what is written on this quote card 
is the most par potent paragraph in the entire writings of Ellen White. I've seen it work miracles in homes. I've seen it save lives. I've seen it weld families back together even after there's been a divorce. And so he said, if you or your husband will follow this, you will have a change in your home. Um, so she left, and he did not see her for a whole year. She came back, and she said, I've been looking all over for you. I want to share what happened. She said, um, the first three months, it was hell is what she said. I felt like I was living with the devil. I've never seen my husband act so mean and ornery and devilish in his whole life. But then after about three months, something began to change. Then we enjoyed the sweetest relationship we'd ever had in our marriage. And that continued. Um, but something happened. She said, one day we decided to take a drive up to the hills which we'd done many times before, we left the baby with my husband's mother. Even though she's getting quite old, she loved to care for the little one, and she felt she was capable of caring for the 11-month-old. Um, Grandma's medicine, though, was left on the end of the Davenport, and she had read and kind of dozed off, and when she looked up, that baby was swallowing the pills. And the grandma went into shock and just couldn't couldn't move. And um, the woman says that when she and her husband came back, they found the, the grandmother in a coma and the baby, I mean, sorry, the, the baby in coma and the grandmother in shock. And the baby ended up dying. Um, and she said, you know, it was difficult because it was an unexpected, you know, but what made it harder was all these church members came and brought her sympathy. This went on for days, and I accepted their sympathy. I'm going to read her words here. She says, after a few days, I began to feel the same old resentments, the same feelings that I had when I came to visit you the first time at camp meeting. She said, I began to realize that I had failed the Lord. I had pledged him that I would accept everything that touched my life as coming from Jesus, but I had not accepted the death of my child as coming from his hand. So she rushed to her bedroom and fell on her knees and repented, said, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. I accept the death of my baby as coming from your hands. You know what you're doing. I don't. I don't enjoy it. I don't like it, but I know that you know what you're doing, and in good time, you'll let me know. So she got up from her new knees just as someone else was coming to sympathize with her. Um, but this time she said, I don't want to appear rude for your kindness, but please don't sympathize with me. I gave my life to Jesus a year ago, and I gave my baby's life to him just the same. And we are in the hands of Jesus. He knows what he's doing. I don't. So please, instead of sympathizing, would you kneel and thank Jesus for what he's doing in our lives? So they knelt and prayed. The, the lady left immediately, and a few people came to offer sympathy. Um, but as soon as people realized I did not want sympathy, they stopped coming. About three weeks later, uh, the doorbell rang. I went to the door, and there stood my husband's mother and father. May we come in and talk with you? Now, this is the woman that had been there when the baby died. She said, Dear, we have been watching you, watching you for a whole year. Something has happened. You are not the same girl you were a year ago. We've watched you even closer since the baby died. We've seen no resentment in you. We don't understand it all at all, but we want to tell you something. You see, when we were teenagers, we were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but since our marriage, neither one of us has seen inside of a Seventh-day Adventist Church. Never. Our son was reared out of the church entirely, but if God can do in you what he's, if God can do in you what he's done in you in one year's time, then he can do it in us too. We're going to come back to church. Two months later, they were baptized. But that's not all. After they were baptized, this, she says her husband came to her. And he said, honey, you are not the girl I married. If God can do in you what he has done in the past year, if he can go in my, into my parents and do what he has done in them in such a short time, then he can do it in me also. Glowing with happiness, she continued, One week ago, my husband was baptized a born-again Christian. 
Now I understand. In the earth may do, I'm going to have my baby, my little girl, my husband, and his parents. I understand now that God works in marvelous ways, his wonders to perform. And um, she just goes on and claims some of the promises in the Bible about rejoicing and um, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do when people do things to hurt us. And so I wanted to end with this Bible verse. It's in Psalm 107. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And this is repeated four times in that chapter. It's important. And I don't believe it's because selfishly God wants praise. It's because he knows he can pour out his blessing upon us. Psalm 22 says that he inhabits the praises of his people, right? And another thought that he's given me recently is that we were designed to praise him. In heaven, the angels praise him. That's, that's what they do. And if we learn to praise God now while we're on earth, then we can begin a little heaven while we're still on earth, right? Amen. So I just appeal to you guys today, God wants to work a miracle for you today. He's already, I've already had several. In fact, I've gotten a journal. I've started writing down the things God does for me every day. And I've had, I mean, multiple ones every day. But on the days that... I don't have any. It's not because of him. It's because I didn't ask, right? <laughs> so that is my prayer and my appeal to you today. And I'm thanking him for what he's going to do in all of our lives. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for revealing this to me, just little glimpses. And Lord, as I said, I know I've only had a little taste of what you want to do. And I just, um, we're asking for a, a revival of primitive godliness, Lord. We're asking for a greater experience with you. Increase our faith. Let us ask more of you. So I know that you are longing for us to expect great things of you. And um, so I'm thanking you for what you're going to do in the lives of these precious people that are hearing right now and in my life, that you will continue and that others will see our lives. And that is the reason they will come pleading with us for what we have. It's not our doctrine or not preaching at them, but our lives that will be a testimony to these people that you have put in our path. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.